also serves as coordinator of the department's World Trade Center health programs. Prior to his appointment as director of NIOSH in 2002, Dr. Howard served as chief of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health in the California Labor and Workforce Development Agency from 1991 to 2002. Dr. Howard. Thank you very much, Congressman Norton, and I'm pleased to be here to provide an overview about the efforts by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health to prevent work-related injuries and illnesses to public safety workers like police officers, emergency medical technicians and firefighters, and also to the Transportation Security Administration employees. Public safety workers are called upon to respond. The HHE program has received 218 requests to investigate potential occupational hazards amongst public safety workers and among TSA workers. These requests have, have concerned uh, indoor air quality, heat, noise, infectious agents, lead, carbon monoxide, musculoskeletal issues, diesel exhaust, radiation exposure. Between 2002 and 2003, NIOSH received three HHE requests from TSA baggage screening employees at the Cincinnati, Honolulu, and Baltimore airports, which focus on potential exposures to diesel exhaust, dust, noise, hazardous items found in baggage, and to x-rays from baggage screening machines. In 2003, NIOSH received also a separate request from TSA management to determine the levels of radiation emissions from various TSA screening equipment and to determine whether routine use of dosimetry is warranted. NIOSH responded by conducting an extensive field evaluation, the objectives of the evaluation to assess work practices, procedures, and training, uh, and also to provide criteria uh, for uh, future actions. NIOSH observed the work practices and procedures uh, followed by baggage screeners and conducted tests uh, of around 281 screening machines to detect X-ray emissions. NIOSH found that nearly 90 percent of the TSA baggage screeners received no measurable occupational X-ray radiation exposure. None of the participants' doses exceeded OSHA's permissible exposure limit of 1,250 millirem per calendar year quarter, nor did measured doses exceed 25 percent of the OSHA quarterly limit, which would have required routine employee monitoring. However, there were a few employees that had small uh, measures of uh, exposure. NIOSH attributed the radiation exposure to improper maintenance of machines, to equipment design limitations, insufficient training, and improper work practices. NASH made several recommendations to address each of these issues, including conducting monthly or quarterly dosimetry targeted at specific airports for a year to further evaluate the radiation doses obtained in the NIOSH evaluation. NIOSH also encouraged employees to notify their supervisors about equipment malfunctions, to use proper equipment to clear bag jams and screening machines, and to avoid overriding the machine safety features. As new technologies and products are brought into the workplace, NIOSH will continue to assess their impact on work-related injury, illness, and disability through our research and prevention strategies. Thank you very much, and I'm pleased to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Uh, Shelby Hallmark has served as Director of the Office of Workman's Com Workers' Compensation Programs at the U.S. Department of Labor since 2001. From 1990 to 2001, he was the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs Deep Deputy Director with stints as Acting Director. He has served in numerous capacities within the Department of Labor since 1980. Mr. Hallmark. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss OWCP's role in providing benefits under the Federal Employees Compensation Act, FECA, to injured uh, federal workers, including those in high-risk occupations. The Secretary of Labor is fully committed to ensuring that all injured workers receive the, the care and compensation they deserve through the services that we provide. We are aware that some of our fellow feds are subject to unique risks and we're proud that our program provides comprehensive support for those who need it. Under the FICA, we provide compensation for wage loss, medical care for on-the-job illnesses and injuries, we facilitate return to work upon recovery, and we pay benefits for survivors. FICA covers 2.7 million federal and postal workers around the world and some others. Uh, it may be the largest self-insured workers' compensation system in the world. It's also perhaps the most generous workers', workers compensation system in the world, paying 75 percent of the uh, injured workers' uh, date of injury uh, gross salary tax-free. 
In addition, FECA does not arbitrarily limit the duration during which benefits may be paid, as some state systems do. It has no meaningful maximum benefit cap, whereas most states limit uh, compensation to an average weekly wage or a figure of that nature. And its eligibility rules are liberal. For example, there are no arbitrary exclusions for particular disease conditions. And the statute of limitation rules are claimant favorable. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, FICA is a non-adversarial system, meaning that the employing agency, which ultimately covers the cost of benefits, has no standing to appeal OWCP's decisions. Only the worker is a party to the claim, and OWCP examiners make objective decisions based on the case law and the facts in the individual case, with no motive to limit costs. In the year ending June 30, 2010, the program paid out nearly $2.9 billion in benefits. We accepted roughly 86% of all cases filed and rendered a decision within our target time frames in the overwhelming majority of cases. But there are some cases which are difficult for the claimant uh, and for OWCP to adjudicate. Uh, traumatic cases of slip and fall and accident, for example, are approved more than 92% of the time and usually within a few days or weeks. But occupational disease claims uh, receive an initial approval only about 52% of the time and may take a few months to decide. A pulmonary condition, uh, for example, can be much more difficult to ascribe to specific causation factors than a traumatic incident. If evidence submitted with an initial claim is insufficient to accept that case, the claims examiner will explain what is needed to establish the case and may assist the claimant in gathering uh, medical evidence directly. Roughly one-third of those uh, occupational disease cases who are turned, uh, which are turned down uh, result in the claimant returning with more information, usually with more medical evidence, uh, and being successful in perfecting their claim. But fundamentally, these outcomes reflect the fact that occupational disease cases involve murkier situations where the cause of the illness may be ambiguous. OWCP strives to get the right result in every case, but we recognize that no system is perfect and we continue to work to improve our processes so that each claimant receives a fair, accurate, an understandable decision, even if it's not the outcome he or she might have preferred. Providing more information and access to claimants, employing agencies, and medical providers has been a high priority. We already have uh, case status information available online. In 2011, we'll launch an interactive web-based system that will, for the first time, allow claimants to file their claim forms directly with OWCP and allow them and their agencies and their doctors to upload evidentiary doc documents directly into the OWCP case file, thus speeding the process. During 2011, we will also implement a greatly enhanced telephone system that will allow our staff to communicate more effectively with workers and deliver improved services. I'm very excited about one other major project, the one that you mentioned, Chair, uh, Chairwoman uh, Norton, uh, the President's Power Initiative, protecting our workers and ensuring reemployment. Uh, he announced that on Monday. He directed the agencies uh, to work to make uh, federal workplaces safer and to improve FICA case outcomes. OWCP and the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration at Labor will work together with all the federal agencies to reduce the incidence and severity of on-the-job injuries, speed claim filing, and help people get back to work more effectively. Uh, establishing that those kinds of goals Measuring them and analyzing results has been shown to yield positive change, and we believe power will save lives, dollars, and federal productivity over the next four years. Uh, I'll be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hallmark. Jill Seagraves is the Director of Occupational Safety and Health, Health and Environment as well as the Radiation Safety Program Manager for the Transportation Security Administration. She began her career, uh, <coughs> excuse me, she began her occupational safety career 26 years ago with the Department of Army and has worked in a variety of positions in both the federal government and the private sector. Uh, Ms. Seagraves. Thank you, Congressman Norton. 
I'm pleased to be here today and thank you for the opportunity to discuss TSA's Occupational Safety and Health Program and the key initiatives we have implemented to promote a safe and healthful work environment for our employees who occupy the front line in protecting our homeland and to address the recommendations outlined in the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health NIOSH study evaluation of radiation exposure to TSA baggage screeners. I'm a certified safety professional with over 26 years of occupational safety and health as you mentioned and in working with the TSA since January of 2003 was part of a team as the startup of the Occupational Safety and Health Program. The Occupational Safety, Health and Environment Program is TSA's major program office responsible for all safety and environmental activities including policy development, program support and technical assistance to airports, field units and TSA headquarters personnel. In March 2003, TSA submitted a health hazard evalu evaluation request to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health to perform an independent study to determine the levels of radiation emissions from the various TSA screening equipment and whether routine use of dosimetry was warranted. This request was based on employee concerns about exposure to x-rays from the carry-on and check baggage screening systems. Over the course of the following months, TSA coordinated closely with NIOSH investigators to discuss their findings and implement recommendations for safe work practices, radiation safety training, and equipment design and maintenance. A key finding was that none of the participants' radiation doses exceeded the Occupational Safety Health Administration's criteria above which employee dosimetry would be required. However, NIOSH recommended TSA perform an additional radiation dosimetry study for at least a year to evaluate the differences observed between airports and to address deployment of new systems. In April 2009, the NIOSH recommended radiation dosimetry study commenced at six airports. Preliminary results reveal that TSO's exposures are well below the criteria that would require TSOs to wear personal dosimeters. Today, all of our procurement specifications and engineering reviews of new screening technology consider the safety of our employees. Technology is only deployed once we have certified that it is safe. We work with organizations such as the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Federal Occupational Health, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and the U.S. Army Public Health Command for technical reviews and independent evaluations. TSA's occupational safety professionals routinely visit our nation's airports to provide support and address safety concerns, workforce training to enhance both the safety of the employees and the security of the traveling public has taken center stage in building a mature, skilled, and professional workforce. In addition to formal training programs, employee outreach has expanded through the use of social media and online communications, allowing us to quickly transmit information on a variety of issues, including worker safety, to our employees and to receive feedback from our employees through TSA's Idea Factory, Blog Central, and the National Advisory Council. TSA not only maintains a high level of safety for our workforce, but continues to focus on innovative ways to raise the bar. We are working to create and sustain a culture of safety at TSA where employees feel a sense of responsibility for their own safety and that of their colleagues and the public. The National Advisory Council, with the support of my office, has launched I've Got Your Back, a campaign to promote safety awareness. Working together, it is our goal to provide the safest work environment possible to enable TSA employees to focus on their mission of keeping the American traveling public safe. Our safety and health initiatives, training programs, and internal and external partnerships have fostered a safer working environment for TSA employees. This is demonstrated through federal performance metrics for safety and workers' compensation programs. The total case rates for injuries and illnesses and those cases that result in lost work days reported by TSO in this fiscal year are approximately 80 percent less than the rates reported in fiscal year 2005. These improvements have led to workers' compensation cost savings of more than 25 percent over the same time period. I have been privileged to serve as director of TSA's Office of Occupational Safety, Health and Environment and to develop a comprehensive safety and health program. TSA recognizes that its strength as an organization depends upon the safety of its workforce and that its mission is as a risk-based, intelligent-driven agency is measured not only by its protection of the traveling public but also by its commitment to protecting the safety and health of its workers. I thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Seagraves. Uh, let me begin with Dr. Howard. Um, 
Dr. Howard, I was uh, interested in the part of your testimony um, uh, involving uh, observers who recommended that six machines uh, be taken offline because of, of uh, potential exposure. Uh, I wonder if these employees were informed of this potential exposure at, at the time where they advised to see a physician? Uh, what disposition was made of the employees now that we're dealing with the machines? The, um, <clears throat> the, the overall study um, involved about 850 workers. And uh, it wasn't an entirely negative study. Uh, there were uh, two workers uh, that had uh, doses that uh, came close, uh, actually exceeded the monitoring threshold that, for instance, uh, the NRC has for a routine dosimetry program. In 13 of the 854 workers, uh, they exceeded uh, the monitoring threshold for DOE. So our recommendation was for TSA, and there's a lot of limitations to our study. First, these were volunteers and several other things. So we asked TSA so to look volunteer? at. Who were volunteers, Dr. Howell? These were study subjects, and we asked them, would you like to participate in the yes. study? So then our recommendation was, given those so limitations. So why was that a limitation? It was a limitation because we didn't have everyone who was exposed. So it's not a in the scientific. Uh, not a totally scientific. Sort of like a, a medical uh, investigation to look at uh, uh, a volunteer uh, study. It, it was we didn't enroll everyone in it. So we were somewhat concerned about the representativeness of the entire population. So the the, rec the major recommendation we had is for TSA to take a year and do a more thorough study so that we would be able to establish what exposures were actually occurring. So in response to your specific question, those individuals that uh, were part of the study subjects that had uh, elevations above zero, and there were very few of those, they didn't get to the level where we would have recommended they see a physician. They were still very low levels and, in fact, below the level in most cases where we would have even have recommended a dosimetry program. So we wouldn't have recommended medical evaluation. So you found no exposures that were particularly harmful? Then. Not particularly harmful, but we were concerned because the study itself was uh, lasted only a short period of time, and most of the recommendations are a, a, a quarter of a year or a calendar year. What's the key for study? a random study from being done? I'm sorry? What is to keep a, a, a normal kind of study from being done? Why do you have to go and ask for volunteers? Well, our particular program, the Health Hazard Evaluation Program, is not a research study. It's in the, uh, in the characterization of a public health surveillance study. I don't understand that, Dr. Howard. They're, they're, if they're, it's going to be valuable to you or to us in evaluating uh, what should be done, why not do it the way every other scientific study is done? Uh, would there be any reluctance of people to come forward? Right. It's, uh, if I could explain it, it's a requested type of evaluation. So it's not a research study per se. It's a requested evaluation, a quick c tell us what the problem is and so we can better define it. So it's not a research study in the way that you're thinking of it. It's an evaluation program. So it's more like I a... I hear you, Dr. Howard. I don't know how to evaluate it, though. Right. If we have uh, a bunch of volunteers not randomly selected, uh, if we don't have the usual uh, control group, I mean, <laughs> so it's, it, it, it would be hard for me to see even the value of such a study, frankly. Well, the value is we found some workers whose exposure came close to that requirement by a number of federal agencies that say you have to have a routine dosimetry program. And so our recommendation was, TSA, you need to follow this up and do a more thorough study with although more not, Although those were the ones you saw, the volunteers, who knows, they could have been young people who who were never exposed to anything because they're just not old enough or haven't been there long enough. Uh, you found nothing that you would, would, you would ask uh, even 
your own family to go see a physician and so now all you can tell them is why don't you do a real study and I don't know why I didn't do a real study to begin with especially since there was a concern that had been raised right it's a program that is designed to quickly go out and identify conditions in order to follow up on them I, I hear you Dr. Howard um, if there had not been concern raised and what uh, it, it seems to me why well, take all the time to do <laughs> studies with the, uh, the where concerns have been raised. Um, I, I hear you, if I were uh, working in the agency, I must say, I, I, as one potentially exposed to such harm, I would take no comfort uh, from uh, such an evaluation and can only wonder why the agency didn't want a deeper study. Um, and we're certainly happy to do that. I understand that you are the messenger. <laughs> Uh, the, the real question goes to the agency, what are you afraid of? You know, if you want to know, then know. <laughs> uh, don't dance around um, the issue. Uh, I tell you, this is how people get liability. <laughs> Speaking now as a lawyer, how you get liability is you should have, you had enough uh, sense of uh, concern so that you should have done a real live study when you should have done it and you didn't and now I have some exposure. Me, the TSA employee. That's what you get when you, when you don't act, uh, you don't, the agency of course I'm speaking does not act pro proactively. Um, Mr. Hallmark, um, uh, as you're aware, we have just done a historic health reform uh, bill past uh, something that the, the um, country has needed for 100 years. The subcommittee has heard from employees, this is very troubling, who indicate that they face large out-of-pocket medical costs, including hospital bills, while waiting for your office to process their claims. I'm not sure what they would do if they didn't have the funds. Um, what do you do? What's your recommendation for these wor uh, workers who are simply waiting to be processed on uh, how they should deal with their own providers demanding uh, payment for services rendered? Um, I understand that, that, of course, some cases may be complicated. And you yourself have testified about the difference in cases uh, uh, with some uh, occupational diseases and uh, different from a traumatic injury on the job, for example. Um, but some of these cases were clear cut on the job accidents that were witnessed by multiple individuals. How can you explain the delay that caused the employee to either make out of pocket? Ex uh, payments or risk losing uh, perhaps uh, the ability to uh, be reimbursed by the provider? Well, without knowing uh, any of the details of the cases that you're referring to, uh, Congresswoman, I, I can't directly explain. I well, can, can only you, is it your view that, that there is no delay in these kinds of uh, ordinary kind of traumatic on-the-job accidents? Well, I, I would say, uh, as I suggested in my remarks, there are always complicated cases. Some, some of them, are, a lot of the complicated cases have to do with occupational disease. So you think those complications, explain, may mean, those complications may mean that um, no payment is going to be required at all? Is that what you're saying? In the circumstance when we're making an initial determination about the acceptance of a claim of the, of the uh, uh, original injury, uh, we have to make a determination that in fact the injury meets all the criteria for uh, coverage under the FECA. Uh, oftentimes there are uh, complexities, even with uh, on a traumatic case, you mentioned uh, uh, situations where to were witnessed, so I take it it's individual traumatic uh, events. Uh, even in those circumstances, there can, can be complexities about whether the uh, activity was in fact covered. I don't know, I'm, you know, I don't know the circumstances of the case you're talking about, but we can have some delays in those cases. While the case is still being adjudicated, uh, there, we would not be able to make uh, a medical payment. 
Uh, of so any kind, of any kind. Of it, when, if we haven't accepted the condition, then we have no ability to make the medical bill payment. Uh, the, uh, the circumstances such, we try to move on very the quickly. Job, are such on-the-job witnessed accidents um, normally turned down? Not at all. Uh, as I, I believe my testimony indicated, we, we have proved something like 92 or 93 percent of all uh, tr what we call traumatic incidents, which is any kind of an injury that happens in one day. Uh, so the vast majority of those cases are approved. There are some which are not approved uh, for reasons which may be So if an employee came to you, Dr. Dr. Uh, Mr. Hallmark, and said, I am, um, I, I'm, I, I don't have any more ability to make outli outlays on my own behalf, I'm, I'm an employee who has been a good employee, what would you advise that employee? With, res with respect to paying medical bills right. uh, while, while the case the is pending, yeah. uh, it would be my expectation that in most cases providers are willing to uh, wait uh, and or the, uh, the, the employee's uh, health benefit program uh, sh could be uh, convinced to make payments. We often reimburse uh, Blue Cross or other health benefit programs uh, for payments made for a case which later is accepted as uh, work-related but which was not accepted at the time. So there are, there are ways to address those issues, uh, and, but from an OWCP perspective, our primary goal is to get those decisions done very quickly. Uh, we adjudicate the vast majority of cases within our time frames. For uh, traumatic cases, our, we go, our goal is 45 days. Uh, for occupational diseases that are relatively straightforward, our goal is 90 days. Uh, and for ex complicated cases, it's uh, six months. Mm -hmm. we, we meet or exceed those goals in uh, an overwhelming number of cases. But in all programs of this kind, there are cases that are outliers, that are on the edges, where uh, a series of complexities come into play. And those are the ones that sometimes cause these kinds of difficulties. Understandable, Mr. Hallmark. In such a case, while you are processing, uh, would, would, would it be appropriate, or in indeed does it occur, that the agency is, is willing to um, assist the employee uh, so that the information that the claim is being processed uh, is understood to be a good faith one? I mean, I, I'm, the, I'm telling my, uh, I'm giving my, uh, my insurer, my servicer, my story. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't have any more money to pay. I'm only asking because I accept your view, uh, especially given the number of days you're describing, that the agency is in fact in the process. But uh, all we have now is this person who can't front the money anymore. I certainly am not asking you to say, hold it, we're coming with the money. <laughs> I am saying this is an employee of the agency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a good record and no money. And wouldn't it, is there some way you can assist, assist this employee so that this employee uh, is credible when she says that this on-the-job accident witnessed by six people I'm still waiting X number of months. Is, is the agency have any obligation to assist this good employee? Uh, by the agency, do you mean OWCP or the uh, yeah, employee? Yeah, whoever's process, yes, the right. processor. Okay. Uh, there are provisions. Or oh, if you think the agency should do it, I'm, I'm looking for some way <laughs> yeah, I, that I this, this employee is going into bankruptcy waiting right. for you to process their claim can somehow get some assistance. There are, there are certain circumstances in which the employing agency can issue a, a form that provides authorization for a brief period of time, I think it's uh, up to uh, 60 days, I believe, for, for medical benefits. Uh, in the case where, there, where it's not disputed that the injury has, has been work-related, uh, an auto accident, for example, the employing agency is supposed to issue the CA-16 to the injured worker, they can take it with them to the emergency room or to, to a physician, and that provides, in effect, a uh, guarantee that there's going to be payment made for so that. That's medical. kind of an instant right. a, a situation where it was instantaneous. 
guarantee. And of course, I'm, I'm simply going the record that's before us. You don't have any such. Uh, you have witnesses, perhaps, uh, according to those who have <clears throat> been in touch with the, uh, uh, with the subcommittee, but uh, you don't have um, uh, an indisputable right. matter with respect to how much compensation is due. Well, it, it, and it, the, and the, the initial outlay, if you have, I don't know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, is probably not going to be a problem for the servicer in, in the first place. It's when it gets old and time goes on and the employee has no funds mm -hmm. that the concern is raised uh, that, I'm, that I'm raising. Well, as I said, I, I believe it is typically the case that, that uh, health uh, that healthcare, uh, providers like Blue Cross uh, would reject or not pay a case if they know that it has been uh, filed as a workers' comp claim. Uh, I oh, believe, of course. I'm sorry. Yes, that's true. I believe there are there are circumstances of the kind that we're talking about now where there where there could be communications to allow that uh, or to ensure that the the Blue Cross or whoever the carrier is in fact picks up those payments uh, because the the uh, workers' comp benefit is not flowing. Uh, so I my 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 assumption is that in those kinds of cases, what we need to do is communicate more effectively. Uh, between OWCP and the Im injured worker, and in some cases with the uh, uh, medical uh, health uh, provider, uh, as as well as with the uh, employing agency. But as as I say, there are those there are going to be cases where, the, in fact, there there is a dispute. Perhaps the agency, even though the the event was witnessed, the agency may not believe that in fact it was a work related uh, event. Well, and I so we have, appreciate you know, so your response. I'm sorry. I appreciate your response. Uh, well, the question I'm raising is basically when it goes to communication, um, and, and to, of course, the the um, the burden that the agency may or may not have, uh, but which the employee has, no matter what uh, the decision is, and to the extent that communication, so that people know it's being processed. All, all to the good. And the reason I raise it is because there have been complaints that were transmitted to this subcommittee. Uh, Ms. Seagraves, now as to CSA employees, uh, there have been reports to the subcommittee of employees who, who make it difficult to apply for a Federal Employee Compensation Act or FECA, FECA, or FECA benefits. Uh, the kinds of, of examples they have offered uh, include refusing to provide the necessary paperwork, talking employees out of applying for compensation, and not allowing employees to seek medical attention. Um, would like, you know, understand how when somebody comes to talk to the agency that there are questions to be asked and perfectly legitimate questions, but are you aware of these occurrences? Um, Madam Chairwoman, unfortunately, I'm with the um, Office of Occupational Safety and Health, and that would be a question to pose to the um, Office of uh, Human Capital's um, Office of Workers' Compensation Programs. I asked you if you are aware, Ms. Sager. I'm, I'm not aware of that. No, I'm not. Um, so you've never heard of people, um, um, you don't think perhaps training might be necessary? Um, by uh, your agency for TA, TSA managers and supervisors who receive some, are you troubled by this? Um, again, I've, I've not heard any of this information, you know, to validate that and, and to comment. And you're saying who has heard it is who? I'm saying that um, in my capacity, I've not heard of these issues. Who would have heard it? Um, again, our Office of Human Capital, Office of Workers' Compensation Program. Now, what I will say is that, you know, we do have communications set up, so for employees to voice different issues. I'm sorry, would you we, say we that? Do have, we do have uh, what I think is a, is a pretty robust communications program for employees to raise issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, in my capacity from the occupational safety health side, I've, I've not heard of those claims or those concerns. Well, that was, that was one that stood out for me. Um, are the results of the radiation surveys uh, that, that, that are performed on TSA equipment posted? 
so well, that employees um, have access to these results? What we do do is instead of um, posting the full packet you know, on, a, on a system, we do provide what we call a, a radiation safety survey sticker. And so it informs the employee that when the survey was done and when the next one is due. However, at any time, they can request a copy of the survey for their review. That, so it is available. It's just not something that's put right on the system. So it's available. There's a sticker that... Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's mounted on the systems, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, Dr. Howard, uh, uh, your observers apparently uh, did observe some unsafe practices, um, uh, poor work practices. What should TSA be providing its employees in terms of training uh, and equipment to deal with the unsafe practices uh, you found in clearing, for example, bag jams? Employee training uh, is really a vital link in protecting employees, and it's the employer's responsibility to make sure that the training program is uh, covers all of the issues and is effective. The employees understand the issue, and so they're empowered to be able to make the changes themselves because oftentimes workers are not directly supervised every minute of their job. For instance, one of the practices that we noticed is uh, uh, un unjamming a baggage uh, jam. Oftentimes, uh, passengers will push their bags through. They'll get stuck in the machine. And one of the administrative controls we recommended is for employees not to be putting their arms into the machine to extract baggage, but rather to use a, an instrument that would protect them from that. So that's a, a very simple type of procedure, but it requires uh, training, it requires reinforcement of that training. So that's an important recommendation to protect uh, employees from that particular uh, practice. Thank you. Yeah, some, some, some things are very common sense, but you've got to be aware of them. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hallmark, um, uh, very good to, to hear of a reduction in the total injury case rate and lost injury time. Um, could this partially stem from agencies reporting fewer injuries and not solely from increase, increased focus on workplace safety? We're not trying to take credit from uh, whatever focus that, that has been, but going back to the question that I raised mm -hmm. initially with Dr. Howard, we need to understand um, as much as we can about changes that we see and to the extent that we can um, separate out um, cause and effect. I understand. The, the, uh Pre, the, the power initiative that's just been announced by the president includes uh, goals. We'll be setting goals for each of the agencies to reduce uh, lost time and total case rates, to reduce the number of injuries that people have. But we've also included in that set of goals uh, a focus on timely reporting of injuries when they do occur. Uh, and obviously that's a very good thing from a very from several perspectives uh, we can't do a good job and, and address the kinds of problems you were mentioning earlier if we don't have the claim in hand but another reason for that uh, uh, goal to be included is because we don't want agencies to solve the first problem by not filing claims uh, on uh, as that should have been filed uh, so we want to we the, the reason for having a goal for timely filing is to, is to keep the emphasis on, yes, when an injury occurs, we want that paper to flow, or electron to flow to, to OWCP. We don't want people to dissuade uh, injured workers from coming forward and solve their, you know, reach their safety goals uh, through a, 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 a process that's inappropriate. Uh, obviously, we're key, we are aware of that as a possibility. Uh, we try to stay in touch with it, and we do uh, communicate with agency representatives, uh, including the, the uh, DHS and TSA uh, folks who work with the workers' comp uh, side of the house. Been an actual reduction. I'm sorry. I think there's been an actual reduction then? of injuries. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the number of claims being filed with OWCP has dropped uh, every year since about 2003 or four. 
Uh, actually, it rose uh, in the early years in 2003 and 4, uh, maybe in big part because TSA was ramping up, and TSA had a lot of injuries in its early days. Uh, and it's, it's, they it's, have, however, it, as, as uh, was uh, testified to this afternoon, they have improved their uh, uh, safety record substantially, uh, and they've improved their uh, uh, return to work efforts such that their uh, lost production days which were in uh, 2005, I think, were around 400 lost production days per year per 100 FTE. Uh, it's down to around 100 now. It's still a high number, but 400 was uh, extraordinary. And so That's they're because they're more experienced now. There's turnover there. Uh, several reasons. One is they've reduced the number of injuries. Lost production days can be uh, a, a, if reduced by just not having the injury in the first place. And so been, they have been laudably proactive. Yes, they have been. And they, the other thing you can do is get people back to work when the injury occurs. How and do you do that? Uh, well, uh, in the case of the uh, agencies such as TSA, where the individual has uh, physical requirements, it requires finding ways to, to split up the job, bring people back on sedentary responsibilities. In effect, it requires uh, creativity on the part of, uh, of management. Uh, to find ways to reemploy people uh, and to accommodate them, uh, the same as uh, management should be trying to uh, hire people with disabilities in the first place and accommodate them. So it's uh, that's a management responsibility, and I think TSA has has shown in their in the statistics that they are addressing themselves to that. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Ms. Seagraves, what is the reasoning behind? Uh, disallowing um, the uh, employees uh, at TSA to wear personal dosimeters. Um, did you receive uh, mm. advice from any of the various agencies at DHS or the C CDC, um, et cetera, mm -hmm. on that regard? They apparently did wear right. some such before the federal government took, took them over. Right. Um, the, uh, the responsibility for aviation security screening was performed by, with, by the FAA. And so, but even prior to uh, the TSA and even prior to 9-11, the FAA removed the requirement for radiation dosimetry. So after 9-11 and, of course, whenever then TSA ramped, ramped up, then the radiation dosimeters were, were not issued. But the, well, wait a minute. If an employee has his own you can't wear it anyway. Well, there's a. It's not as simple whenever you um, to just give to have employee just go out and buy their own dosimeter. I mean, just it's it's not as simple. Uh, unfortunately, you have to have control badges. We have to have a mechanism to be able to read that badge and then understand where that uh, badge has been during the course of the individual's wearing. So, for example, with their own personal device. Mm -hmm. So what do you care about whether or not it has its batteries, you know? Well, yeah, but again, it just, it just um, we would still have to have the control, to control with that to be able to make a determine of the actual Well, you go, I'm not asking you to use it to make determinations. Okay. If, if I want to wear it myself, why can't I wear it myself? Is, well, what I'll say is the fact that um, in my capacity, my requirement is to um, do the proper assessments, do the proper analysis and evaluations, and to make determination whether or not radiation dosimetry is required. So if there's, and if we are well below the occupational safety health dose limits, um, so if the, if the individual wants to voluntarily wear one, then, then I would refer to my um, senior leadership then to make that decision. So you don't see anything wrong with that, do you? I mean, that can't hurt. But again, I, we would have no control over to the results of that, that dosimeter. No, and that's what you'd say. If someone yes. came running to you, uh, you have a perfect answer. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> from the employee's point of view, it looks strange. Mm -hmm. It looks like you don't want them to know. And of course, they can't know mm -hmm. because their device is not being monitored by the federal agency. So as long as they know that it has no effect, it gives them some comfort, you know, like sucking your thumb, excuse me. Uh, but at least you have it on you, or maybe your wife insists that you do it even though she does not know what she is talking about. Why would the agency want to make trouble in that family by saying, now oh, you're going to get fired if you take your own? Well, and I'm not really similar. sure that, that that's been presented, to, that, that employees have actually been denied. I think, you know, at least from my, my standpoint, we have educated the workforce to tell them 
you know, what the doses are and, and, and um, excuse me, what the emissions are from the Would system. Would you find out what the exact policy is on that and within 30 yes. days report yes. that to the mm -hmm. committee? I can do that, yes. Um. I'd like to go back to Dr. Howard. Uh, could you advise the subcommittee on, on other federal occupations that uh, would deserve or need uh, close scru scrutiny for exposure concerns? Well, the risk uh, in the federal workforce uh, varies by the exposure to biological, chemical, physical agents. So, for instance, in the public safety sector where we have uh, police, firefighting, uh, correctional officers, uh, other types of, uh, of public safety officers, th those, um, those occupations are, are at high risk and there are a number of exposures that are important there. As we've talked about with TSA baggage screeners, there are a number of exposures including radiation that are important. So the general uh, sector of public safety is one in which you look at injury and illness rates and they tend to be higher than other occupations so they deserve a lot of attention and indeed we have done a number of both uh, health hazard evaluations and research studies uh, in public safety in firefighting in police officers in correctional officers and others so they are high-risk occupations in the federal sector I have jurisdiction uh, in committee I chair uh, over workplace violations here in the legislative sector. And some may remember reading of, um, uh, of um, workers in tunnels of, ex of the Capitol exposed to asbestos. It was shocking. Uh, to um, members and staff to, to hear of this. Um, I would imagine there are similar <laughs> tunnels or pipes that have to be attended to in, in by other federal agencies and other federal, uh, and other federal workers. Do you know of exposure, for example, to uh, asbestos, uh, one of the legendary substances that uh, is being taken down all over the United States with um, effects long ago that can't be rectified, but effects we see every day uh, for workers uh, charged with uh, this task. Well, certainly the situation that uh, you bring up in terms of the Capitol Hill tunnels and asbestos exposure is one that at NIOSH we're very familiar with because we were involved in advising uh, the compliance office of, of Capitol Hill on those issues. But certainly in any workplace, uh, federal or non-federal, the exposure to uh, asbestos in place is a very big issue and it involves a lot but of you have not agencies. had occasion to look at the rest of the federal workplace uh, at these issues only here in the Capitol? And We've had a number of HHEs in federal buildings that have involved possible exposure or potential exposure to fibers such as asbestos, mm -hmm. yes. I would think that would rank right up there with firefighters and, yes. and others. Thank you very much. I see that the real chairman is back. First of all, I want to thank Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton for her kindness and uh, her ability in uh, conducting this hearing uh, in my absence. And I, I really appreciate having having you here and, and having you able to do this uh, allows us to get much more done. I want to thank the witnesses. I apologize. We had boats on the floor, as you know. Uh, but I, I really do appreciate you coming before this committee and helping us with our work. Uh, let's see. Questioning.
in, in reviewing the uh, testimony that was submitted prior to the hearing, uh, I did note in the, uh, the NIOSH uh, 2008 report uh, that uh, researchers had observed uh, covered agency stop buttons. Uh, in your view, based on those surveys done at the 12 airports, does TSA have a uniform uh, lockout and tag out procedure in place when transportation security officers or TSOs uh, must clear these bag jams? And uh, did it appear that the workers were aware of and were following those procedures? Uh, is there any alternative approach here in terms of uh, a suggestion for maybe improving the lockout, tag out uh, procedures? Well, we certainly expressed concern in our report and asked TSA to look at that issue. Um, we did not provide specific recommendations on alternative procedures, but we certainly don't think that uh, the insertion of one's arm into an active machine is a, a good idea in any sense. So we were very concerned about that issue and made recommendations to TSA to provide instruments to remove baggage if they get stuck inside the machine and a TSA uh, employee has to, has to get the bag out. Okay. Did, uh, did they respond in any way that indicated that they might be moving toward that? Uh, well, certainly in our evaluation, we provide the recommendations to employees and to the employer in our HHE. We don't necessarily uh, do oversight on whether the recommendations are implemented, so Mr. Seagraves may have an answer to that particular issue. Uh, were, were you at all able to, you know, and this is completely uh, something that came up in my discussion with some of the TSA employees about uh, the new scanning machine, the total body scanning machine, and uh, the number of x-rays that uh, I guess they're, they're tiny x-rays are very brief. Or, uh, but there's a lot of concern there among the rank and file, uh, just the folks uh, uh, that, that I run into. I, I'm in and out of airports all the time. And there's a concern about, well, they, they realize it's not, not overexposure for the passenger. but for the TSOs that are standing there and conducting this hour after hour, uh, they were concerned. I raised the, con I raised, uh, the issue with uh, uh, George Nakara at, uh, at Boston, at Logan Airport, and he didn't seem that concerned, but I still felt that, you know, there hadn't been a really in-depth uh, look at this, and you have any sense of uh, what uh, hazards that might present or well, certainly, you know, from a radiation safety perspective, the issue would be how much scatter there is from the machine. Obviously, the passenger is standing there at the beam. So the question in any of these situations is how much scatter is there. If there's any scatter at all, then can you protect or shield the employee from that scatter? For instance, the baggage screening machines have flaps and it's enclosed. So in the body scanner, that, that would be the issue. We have not, NIOSH has not evaluated body scanners. Um, we're happy to do so at TSA's request or employee's request, but we, we haven't actually done that kind of work yet. So. Okay. Uh, anybody else have a secret? Yes, um, we have evaluated the AITs, both from a public dose limit as well, I mean, to, a dose to the public as well as our employees. And so and there's an American National Standards Institute standard that we must follow to ensure the safety and health of not only the public but our employees. So the dose that are emitted from these machines are very, very low. And so when the employees are standing beside the machine, they are not receiving a dose. Okay. So we instruct our employees, uh, there's an, an area around the system that has a mat with a, with a yellow line on it and that we tell them, you know, just to stay away from that or stay off of that, I should say, so that their radiation exposure is as low as reasonably achievable. Um, in Boston, we have placed area radiation dosimeters on the systems up there and um, we've uh, started in April and so we should have, uh, hopefully have evaluation results on those shortly. But even with the surveys that we're doing, it's it's almost it's just background. Yeah, is it? Are you asking the TSOs to uh, wear dosimeters or anything like that? To you know? No, there, there's no requirement to do so at this time, and that's why we're doing the area dosimetry. So yeah, mm -hmm. it might you know it might actually mm -hmm. help with confidence for the employees if we somehow allowed them to wear dosimeters mm -hmm. and then allowed them to have an impartial reading of that to figure out if they're picking up REMS or 
uh, any 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 radiation. I just uh, I think it would give them great peace of mind if they were able to become part of that process. Uh, you know, I, I think that, that might go a long way. I don't discount what you're saying mm -hmm. in any way, but I, I think that uh, it might be more convincing for the employees and it, and it might uh, rule out any aberration that might be uh, something that might be missing if it was actually on the TSO, uh, the, the, the uh, the screener themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, would, would that be something legislatively that we would, I know uh, TSA hasn't asked for it, uh, you know, a, a, a more uh, thorough screening process uh, f for the body scanners. Is that something that, that you would rather us do or? Oh, you mean as far as uh Personnel. The, the, the availability of dosimetry on personnel for the, yeah. that operate the EITs, we can certainly take a look at that. You know, we're, we're performing a personal dosimetry um, at six airports now based on the recommendation from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So we can certainly look at that. We, we do have a start, though, with the area dosimeters placed on these systems, again, only at Boston, uh, Cincinnati, and uh, Los Angeles. So uh, surveys and um, independent evaluations, you know, again, state that these systems are safe both for the, the folks in the public as well as our employees. But uh, okay. we can certainly look into doing some uh, personal radiation dosimetry. Would there be any uh, enhanced vulnerability to, say, pregnant women or, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's one example, I guess, uh, being exposed to that low level of radiation or is that there's something that might expose the fetus to that, uh, you know, to danger as opposed to, you know. Uh, from the public or from the employee? Either. Either? No, there is none. There is none. Okay. So again, we're following the American National Standards Institute standards that lays out the requirements for uh, the doses of the system, and these systems are well, well below the ANSI standard. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I wonder if you could describe the kinds of unsafe work practices that have been witnessed by NIOSH staff in regards to uh, the what were described as poor work practices. What, in your opinion, should TSA be providing its employees in terms of training and equipment to properly deal with uh, the, the clearing of the bags, the jams that might occur? Right. and and. Uh, Again, I think uh, there are two issues. One is uh, is proper training, uh, because there is, a, I think, a, 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 an importance to making sure that employees realize the risk of inserting their arm into an active machine before turning it off, et cetera. Having the proper equipment supplied by the employer to unjam a bag jam is extremely important, instead of using your arm to use an instrument. Uh, so all of those things are extremely important in making sure there's no unnecessary exposure. Uh, the flaps of the machine that you stick your bag through are protective. They act as a shielding for radiation. But when you, when you violate that protection uh, by putting your arm in it, that's a serious issue. So that's probably the most important practice that we would consider improper and, and risky that we would like to see corrected. And I'm sure TSA has paid some attention to that recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the sub subcommittee has heard uh, some complaints uh, about files being lost and misplaced uh, or that are inaccessible. A, a document provided by your office to the subcommittee says that when an appellate body requests a case file, the electronic portion of a file is sent instantly, but the paper portion of that same file must be physically shipped. It seems that when a case file is requested, any paper portion of the file should be made electronic, and then the complete case file uh, be sent electronically. What are the barriers to, to setting that, that type of procedure up? The uh, 
OWCP uh, started uh, imaging cases around 2000, so we have about 10 years now. Uh, we did it prospectively, so all new cases starting then were, were imaged and are totally imaged. Cases which pre-existed, uh, we did not uh, go back and image all of the old files. I see. Okay. Uh, basically, a cost-benefit analysis, we have, uh, there, many of the old files are very, very large, and we just uh, did, couldn't afford to do that. Uh, the, the process, uh, it is, it's been our expectation that over time, the number of cases that have a split file, in other words, an electronic component uh, and a paper component would diminish and that we'll get to the point where we do have a cost-benefit analysis that makes sense to do the, all the back imaging. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay. Uh, we also got some data regarding uh, appeals uh, to the three, three different